Right, one last thing we're up to, and we're going to finish here in five minutes, Chris. Coulomb's Law. You remember when we looked at the gravitational force of attraction between two objects? Anybody remember what it was? How you could quantify the force of attraction between two objects? Oh, is that really big? Is that really big? What the was equation? it? The right. equation. Big G in one and two over D squared. Big G in one and two over D squared. So the force of attraction in words is proportional. The force of attraction between any two point masses is proportional to what? The mass. Nope. The product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, to the distance squared. So m1 and 2 over d squared. This is very important. And right up now, we're coming to something that this, I'd be exaggerating if I said it destroyed Einstein, but it certainly put a serious dent into Einstein's reputation in the last 30 years of his life. He looked at the force of attraction or repulsion between two charges. So if that's one electron and this is another electron, he looked at the force. Now, a couple of hundred years before him, people had worked out what the formula was that dictated what is the force of attraction or repulsion between two point objects. And it turns out that it's not that dissimilar to the force of attraction between two masses. Between two masses, it's proportional to the product of their masses inversely proportional to the distance squared. It turns out that the force of attraction or repulsion, remember here now it can be attracted or repelled, is proportional to the product of their what? charges. You still giving this up? And inversely proportional to? Distance between them. The distance between them. Distance squared between them. So in gravity you had m1, m2 over d squared. Here you've got q1, q2 over d squared. And it seems like it's too much of a coincidence for there not to be some underlying rule that combines the two of them. In other words, there's one basic rule, and you go off one way, and you get a subset, and you talk about gravity. You go off another way, into another subset, and you get this electrostatics. He spent the last 30 years of his life trying to find what that underlying rule was. And in, in, it's, one of the, it, it's pretty much the holy grail of physics, is to find a formula or a theory which ties up electrostatics with gravity. And there are also one or two other forces called the strong and the weak to do with what goes on inside an atom. It's the holy grail of physics to show that there is one theory which combines all of those things together. But Einstein was just looking at gravity and just looking at electrostatics. And because he went off on pretty much a tangent, often it called the second it got nowhere, he lost pretty much the prestige of all his colleagues. This being one of the most eminent scientists which was ever born. And the last 30 years of his life was basically, he's, he's, as I said, he lost the respect of pretty much all his colleagues working in Princeton over in America. So, back to here. That just sets the scene for it. So it does look, there is something pretty unusual about this, John. The different electrons have different charges. Every electron has got the same charge. So then surely you can just take that in for P1, P2. You can. So therefore you'll know what the force of attraction or repulsion is between two electrons. And why, why is it Q1, Q2, Q1, Q2? Because the charges won't always be electrons. Sometimes they might be, you might want to say this guy here has a charge of 10 coulombs, this guy here has a charge of 50 oh. coulombs. What's the charge with him? Yeah, it won't always be electrons. Uh, what else was I going to say? Q1, Q2. Uh, oh, yes, I mean, here's another thing. Very, very simple questions. And I think Mr. Abad talked to you about this in chemistry. If the proton is positively charged, the electron is negatively charged, opposite charges are attract each other, what's the obvious question you should be asking about an atom? Why, are the, Why the electrons not sink into the middle of the nucleus? That's number one. Here's number two. It turns out that the basic charge on an electron, and they have a theory to explain that, that goes into the whole quantum theory and, and Bohr and Heisenberg and all those guys. Here's another one which I didn't realize. I didn't even question this myself. The charge on an electron is the very same as the charge on a proton, except they're opposite, and nobody can explain why just seems to be, again, it's almost like a coincidence, but obviously it's too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence, and there are theories to explain it, but there is no absolute satisfactory explanation to explain why the charge on a proton is the same as the charge on a proton. like one plus one and one minus one. We say plus one and minus one, which is fine for junior cert, but now in terms of coulombs, we have to say, actually, the charge on an electron is 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So one electron is 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So basically a coulomb is way too big of a, of a unit to have for electrons. So it's very small. Just like a kilogram is a big size, you can get a kilogram of sugar, but a proton weighs something by 10 to the minus 24 of a kilogram. 
something like that. And it's the same. We use coulombs for normal big charges like this, but in practice, mo most coulombs are very, very most charges are very, very small percentages. So all you're going to do now, we're going to look at a couple of questions. You'll be given a charge one. You'll be given a charge two. You'll be given the distance between them. And this guy here is going to be called what? In general, constant. Constant proportional constant, and I have to give you a value for that proportional constant. Okay? So k, it's 9 by 10 to the 9. We want, yeah, we look at that, we give you a different value for it, or a different way of expressing it. Q are the charges, R is the distance between the charges. Do charges have to touch each other to attract each other, to affect each other? Nope, they do not. Uh, so what you actually have, just like you have two magnets, could affect each other without touching each other. What would you say if that magnet is there minding its own business and this guy comes along, it enters, actually you if you can just pop over here again just for a second and then you'll be done. How does the first guy know that the second guy exists? It's got a magnetic field there. Yeah, it's got a magnetic field all around it. In, in, in theory that magnetic field goes on into infinity, but in practice you've got to be fairly close to it. So once this enters the guy's magnetic field, it feels the attraction of the repulsion. It's the very same for this charge. <coughs> and just like in junior search science, you've got to show the magnetic field. Remember the term to show the magnetic field of a bar magnet? Well, here we've got to show that if this is a charge, there's actually electric fields. And we've got to be able to see, you can see that electric field, or you can see the effect of the electric field. You can see the effect of the magnetic field by pouring your iron filings around it. You can do something similar with an electric field. It's much smaller than a magnetic field. But again, it's a demonstration that you've got to know for exam purposes. So rather than going on any further, we're going to hold it there, and I'm just going to stick up this formula. So Louise, if you can just stay with me for two minutes. The formula between two charges, so I'd say E because it's an electric field charge, is equal to, what was it? Anybody remember? K times? Q1. 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 Q2 over, over or. D squared or oh. R squared, yeah. Distance mm -hmm. and, and radius. Sometimes if it's a circle, it'll be a radius, but distance squared and R squared. Q1, Q2, these could be electrons, these could be protons, or there could be any multiples of them. Now, the K, it turns out, is equal to 1 over, and this is a little bit complicated, and it's one of the reasons why the sum is straightforward, but doing it in your calculator is going to get quite messy. K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon. So now my formula becomes, and I'll talk about that in a minute, Q1, Q2. Oh, was 9.9. Over D squared. The whole thing together, all of that together works out to be 9 by 10 to the 9 or something like that. What's that? What's the thing 4 pi? Yeah. Pi is just 3.14, and I always think it's amazing that pi seems to pop up in just about every different branch of physics and math. I mean, it's a small little number, 3.14. It relates the radius of a circle to the circumference of a circle. You think that's all it is, big deal. And yet it pops up over and over and over again in all different branches of science. It's it's, it's, it's a bit eerie, for want of a better phrase, it's a little bit eerie. Epsilon, however, is a little bit more straightforward. It, it really is. In fact, for pi epsilon, epsilon it turns it tends. Can anyone else guess? Two charges. The force that the two of them experience depends upon what this charge is, what this charge is, the distance between them. Anything else it might depend upon? Stuff in between. The stuff in between. If the stuff in between is air, there'll be effect. If the stuff in between is iron, there'll be a slightly different effect. If the stuff in between is plastic. So this guy here is known as the permittivity. And permittivity is, is like a, a silly way of saying how much it permits the electric field to be felt on one charge due to the other charge. Right? And the permittivity of air, and that's why, you remember when it said 9 by 10 to, 10 to the power 9 or something for, for K? It will only be that if you're talking about air. So I generally wouldn't use that. In fact, you'll find none of the textbooks use it. They'd use this, and epsilon would be given one value for air, it would be given a different value for plastic, it would be given a different value for water. Okay? So, and it's... So is, e, is E always given to you? Is that epsilon? It'll always be given to you in the exam. You'll be told the permittivity of air, or the permittivity of plastic is whatever. Okay, 